Welcome everyone to module two. Uh, this will be the topic which will be focusing on tax and tax related issues. The first one will be on revenue mobilization, particularly uh, towards the end of the lecture, I will focus on some tax compliance research based on existing survey evidence, as well as uh, some uh, randomized control trials which are conducted on some experiments uh, from some revenue authorities. Okay, let's kick off and let's discuss the first part of the three sequence within this module. So the first part will be focusing on tax policy and performance in Africa. The third chapter of the 2019 Economic Report on Africa will be a very valuable resource. And you can also chase some of the references uh, depending on the time uh, and the depths of understanding that you are uh, aspiring. The trends in tax policy uh, are followed using some uh, ratios and also some key statistics, uh, particularly when we are studying public finance. The tax to the GDP ratio is one of the key variables that we always keenly follow. Uh, and many authorities are measured or even generally a fiscal policy and the fiscal space is studied by following this ratio. Even if uh, I have some misgivings about it, uh, it is still a valid statistics uh, that we follow generally. My, my misgiving is related to other sources of uh, government finance or government revenue or public revenue that can be incorporated into the ratio because the denominator is only focusing on tax revenue. When we discuss non-tax revenue at a later stage, you can imagine how important it is uh, to really include, and you will agree, how important it is to include it into this ratio, meaning by modifying the numerator, we can arrive at a better ratio because we are really disregarding a very, very important component of public finance, which is non-tax revenue. A very tricky component, but it is valid. Therefore, I'm not suggesting that we should disregard tax to GDP ratio in general, but we can report tax to GDP ratio non-tax revenue to GDP ratio and tax plus non-tax revenue to GDP ratio. Uh, to have a very uh, complete or comprehensive understanding of the nature of public finance. There are uh, a variety of reasons uh, which are advanced to explain why tax to GDP ratio in general uh, is very low in Africa. One is the structure of the African economies, which is predominantly characterized by informality. And the second reason is most African governments display inefficiencies. We have the tax base in some cases, and we don't really aggressively administer uh, and collect the required level of tax uh, revenue. So there is a policy enforcement uh, problem when it comes to collection. Therefore, that will really diminish the power that you could have when it comes to public finance or the fiscal space that you, you deserve, given the tax that you have already declared to be paid and collected. The third reason why this ratio, tax to GDP ratio, uh, which is normally reported, is related to uh, the collection of some taxes which are considered to be taxes that governments are reluctant to collect. One is a property tax. There are some technical as well as political economy reasons why that is not the case uh, with regards to property tax, uh, because there is a strong elite influence when it comes to resisting why property taxes are not uh, in the books of the treasury. And Capital gain tax, again, company profits, they should be taxed. Again, there is a toxic mix of collusion between big business and politicians in some countries, which really puts a strain on public finance uh, by not really collecting the relevant level of uh, tax revenue coming from this very lucrative source of public finance for uh, government coffers. 
the property tax, some countries are making progress, even under the pandemic, uh, under COVID, uh, countries like Sierra Leone are uh, pushing forward with property tax. The figure which is mentioned on this slide, uh, 3.1, will give you some idea of the structure of African taxes over the last uh, two decades, uh, as it was as it was reported in era 2019. So clearly we can see indirect taxes are uh, predominantly important and the combination of direct and indirect taxes really uh, contribute disproportionately uh, high percentages towards the total uh, tax revenues that uh, countries collect. And resource taxes are also uh, important uh, depending on the years that you consider, uh, with a big slump uh, in 2016. Otherwise, a fairly a good proportion was collected between 2004 and 2013. The structure of the tax system and performance. Uh, I think understanding the structure is very, very important. At the same time, some of the principles and uh, principles of justice that should really be uh, put in place uh, to really make progress in the way we administer taxes, in the way we uh, develop uh, our capacity to mobilize uh, resources from taxes and also provide the developmental needs that we uh, aim for uh, within a given economy. So I will go through each of the points as follows particularly characterizing uh, what is a good tax system and what is not a good tax system. A, a good tax system should sustainably raise revenue for government with efficiency and also fairness without increasing the burden of taxation on the poor. So we have to really be careful about uh, tax injustice, particularly given the history of public finance in Africa, we either tax those who are poor extremely highly, and we don't really tax those who should really pay and the well-off, uh, not that much. Uh, this is really a lose-lose uh, situation. And therefore, we shouldn't really allow our government and public authorities uh, to really rain on the poor uh, for far too long uh, and uh, demanding uh, tax payment unfairly particularly when it comes to the difficulty of measuring and estimating or calculating the tax capacity of uh, citizens. And we will discuss that when we will make reference to some presumptive taxes that are being used to bring uh, some resolution to some conflicts between taxpayers and tax collection authorities. The second point is, closely related with the efficiency and the fairness point, particularly focusing on the justice aspect, meaning on the fairness side. Progressive taxation, without distorting the incentives to pay, for sure, need to be promoted. And regular check is required whether the system is regressive uh, in terms of uh, tax uh, incidence, particularly. Therefore, the tax structure influence the incidence of each type of tax and the tax incidence analysis is very, very informative. Therefore, we should really uh, check who pays and who bears the burden and whether that is fair or not. If progressivity is not built into a tax system, then that will lead to a lack of incentive to pay and a resentment in society. And, uh, it can also be a root cause for some social unrest, particularly if the, if the system or the taxation system or the incidence or the burden is unfairly on those who are not, uh, relatively speaking, able to pay it. So we have uh, indirect taxes as well as uh, ta direct taxes. You know this from uh, basic principles of public finance in your uh, undergraduate as well as uh, graduate school studies that the direct taxes focus on individuals, corporations, uh, and pre predominantly come from uh, 
pro company profits and individual incomes through uh, payrolls. And in some cases, in well-functioning systems, uh, we have also property taxes uh, contributing a lot to direct taxes. And they are uh, the future for many of the African countries, particularly uh, as we are increasingly push towards domestic resource mobilization to raise the public funds for our development needs. Direct taxes are taxes that are predominantly charged or imposed on goods and services. Sales tax, VAT, value added tax, the turnover tax, tax on financial and capital transactions, excess duties, and the international trade tax. Uh, which is very, very important component of total tax for many countries, which are depending on uh, getting a lot of government revenues through trade. Uh, I think you may be aware of the trade liberalization debate, uh, which usually focuses on this trade off uh, between liberalizing trade and expanding real GDP growth and expanding trade activities with trading partners and the loss of government revenue uh, because of the liberalization that you should really embark on once you liberalize trade because you are going to remove ta uh, taxes on imports and exports in the form of tariff liberalization and also uh, the liberalization of NTBs uh, as they are called, non-tariff barriers. And in that, scenario, you will lose a lot of total uh, government revenue that is usually coming from international trade taxes. Uh, this was really a very, very well-developed debate in the late 1990s and in the early 2000s when many, many African countries liberalized their trade. Tax policy reforms and their impacts. Tax policy reforms include adjusting tax rates and broadening the tax base. And in principle, this sounds very simple, but in practice, very, very uh, difficult. What are some of the key reforms? Uh, key reforms in the administration of taxes included integrating revenue collection responsibilities within a single agency, because it makes it the roles and responsibilities of who should collect it and enforce it carefully, uh, very, very clear. And it also takes a form of semi-autonomous revenue authority and in charge of influencing taxpayers to pay or to comply. Uh, and uh, there are interesting emerging evidence that we will see uh, when it comes to how authorities try to make individuals pay taxes either through uh, threats and in other cases through some incentives. Uh, I think uh, the wisdom so far tells us that uh, you should have a combination of carrots and sticks and meaning rewards as well as punishment. And also even a threat to punish, uh, th therefore uh, tax compliance increases. And th there are a lot of interesting experimental evidence emerging uh, in the last year, in the last 12 months or in the last couple of years from many, many African countries. Because of the need for tax reforms, many countries have really taken a lot of aggressive steps. One country that has done so is Ethiopia, particularly since the, nine, the 2010, uh, over the last 10, 11 years, it has been really uh, aggressively reforming taxes as well as introducing a lot of uh, different types of taxes and also going aggressively to collect it. Uh, in some cases, not justified because of the different disproportionate tax incidence, which seems to be uh, against the fairness principles that we were talking about a few minutes ago. Based on the Laffer curve literature, which highlights the negative revenue effect of excessively high tax rates, a number of African countries reduce tax rates. And this makes sense. Uh, but sometimes who is paying lower taxes? Is it the disproportionately poor individuals who are on the lower end of the income distribution or uh, the, the company owners who are earning uh, 
very, very high profits. Uh, unfortunately, some of these uh, tax rate reductions were for those who are really well off already, like uh, on corporate income tax rate. Uh, this is not necessarily to benefit businesses, even if that is also the case, but some of the reason behind this reduction in corporate income tax rate is given by the competition that African governments have in terms of attracting companies to work within their jurisdiction. So that is uh, an outcome of a, a, complex set of, a complex set of factors. Uh, this competition, uh, a, a rush to the bottom, uh, of, as they call it, is uh, contributing to this uh, state of affairs. But it shouldn't be only concentrated on a single tax, but there are other measures that can be taken as part of the reform to broaden the base uh, for taxation. We continue discussing tax policy reforms again. Uh, in most cases, simplification of tax systems will do the job. Uh, for instance, Egypt has done that, uh, but not yet uh, achieving what is desired because Tax collection is, is a complicated affair, not only in developing and emerging economies, but also in advanced uh, countries. Sometimes the simplification uh, it depends on integrating existing ta tax systems, combining one or two uh, taxes into a single one. But in general, if you go and check any archive of uh, a fiscal authority, a, a treasury, you will find that the tax documents are the most complex, the most bulky, and they run into huge volumes uh, of uh, pages. So it, this simplification of tax system is long overdue and many countries should really do it. And uh, there is a lot of uh, vested interest in paying or in not paying these taxes, uh, whatever types they are uh, in any jurisdiction. Uh, therefore, the complication uh, is rooted in a lot of revisions, legislations, uh, ta tax reforms, uh, which have been taking place over the last uh, 50, 60, 60 years, especially since uh, independence for many African countries and the systems inherited from our former colonialists, uh, except for very, very few of them who have a mixture of tax collection systems uh, that comes from different traditions. Okay, uh, broadening the tax base is still the challenge for many, many African countries. And they are taking the challenge and they are realizing the need for domestic resource mobilization. And to give them credit, many countries are trying a lot. Governments are always looking for expanding the tax net and broadening the tax base, particularly they, some of them were working on attracting the informal sector into the uh, uh, formal uh, tax mate. Uh, th that is tricky, but it is doable. Uh, I think bringing them into the tax net is not uh, always to exploit them. It should also be designed in such a way that the informal operators are given the necessary service for their day-to-day -day business activities uh, as a return to the tax obligations that they will be subject to. Uh, I think, for instance, providing a space for them to work and also establish their micro enterprise, uh, to have some shelter instead of uh, vending on the streets of Africa. So uh, a win-win situation can be uh, found uh, because I remember very well uh, when I travel back and forth to my country, there are days whereby informal operators, informal traders, who are selling all sorts of items like formal traders, formal shops, formal boutiques, and formal uh, markets, they are given few days of the week to sell items, and the government dedicates a certain portion of a location within the capital city and roads are blocked and traders are allowed to set up their stalls and provide the service that the public wants and the public also knows where they are because this is a dedicated road for 
informal trade operators uh, to trade and also do their daily business activity based on their micro enterprise. So in that sense, if the government asks them a very modest tax payment in exchange for the provision of such a service, uh, I don't think they will be uh, unwilling, rather they will be willing to pay. Therefore, there is a mechanism whereby they can be brought into uh, the formal uh, settlement. And it is a very complex uh, sector to manage, even under COVID, for instance, uh, because there is no dedicated permanent working space, they should go out there and earn a living. Therefore, even if you have a social distancing regulation as in advanced countries, social distancing may not mean anything uh, to informal uh, operators because they should go out and survive. So it is a very complex and also a very urgent issue to really find a solution for formal sector operators. Uh, so that they will get the service that they deserve, and also that they will also they deserve the protection that the government should give them. Any government should really aim to bring them into the former segment of the economy in in some manner, uh, even if they cannot really be uh, registered as uh, well-established medium enterprises that uh, we, we think of uh, an enterprise or we think of a fur or when we think of a fur. So a, lo a lot of important uh, tax broadening or tax base broadening uh, elements can be uh, found. Uh, in recent years, East African countries such as Uganda introduced controversial taxes such as uh, social media tax, Yes, uh, this is really one uh, example whereby when FinTech is providing the financial services in the form of mobile money transactions for many uh, uh, women as well as young people in Africa, uh, it is somehow reasonable to ask for some service payments or payment against the service that an individual gets. But I think taxing the big tech or the companies behind or the big tech companies is more of a priority and it can also generate more income uh, with few taxpayers instead of really uh, pushing too hard on social media tax. Uh, this was resisted by individuals in uh, Uganda as far as I know. Uh, in decline, uh, this resulted in a decline of number of internet and mobile money transaction users and this will not help the financial inclusion plan of countries and long-term growth of economies. Uh, Professor Juguna, who is the executive director of uh, African Economic Research Consortium, uh, was at the heart of introducing M-Pesa uh, in, uh, in Kenya when he was a, a central bank governor. And he, he wrote a very, very interesting piece about uh, these social media attacks in uh, Brookings papers. So if you check the website of Brookings Institution, which is based in uh, Washington, uh, Professor Jukuna's piece, I think appeared in 2018, 2019, and he regularly contributes to Brookings uh, blogs and does also short policy pieces. So it will be very interesting to read that from a central banker uh, perspective and also who is at the heart of key policy making when it comes to mobile money transactions in the, content, in the continent of Africa. Because in PESA was just a pioneering example of mobile money transactions and its power for financial inclusion within uh, our continent. Okay, there is a pressure for uh, resource mobilization, but we shouldn't really compromise the, the social justice and the fairness principle of uh, taxation uh, when it comes to broadening the tax base. One good way of raising revenues uh, to collect existing taxes with better administrative efficiency without really introducing a new one, but at the same time, if you want to broaden and have a, a larger fiscal space and if the economy structure allows it 
uh, you can introduce new ones like the VAT and so on. And many, many countries have introduced that now in recent years. Some health-related taxes are effective and innovative, and they should be pursued. For instance, taxing sugar, taxing tobacco consumption, taxing alcohol more. If you drink a pint of beer in Sweden, uh, it is much more expensive than a pint of beer I drink in the UK uh, because uh, of the healthcare tax or the healthcare-related tax in those places like in, the, in Scandinavia. In Scandinavia and Nordic countries is much, much higher. Uh, okay, as uh, I said, uh, these health related taxes mirror the sugar and the fizzy drink tax uh, in advanced countries. Some countries are introducing those. There is one example that I want to share with you uh, based on a publication. Uh, in the Service Industries Journal, which I uh, had the privilege of editing uh, in 2018 with Professor Colin Williams of uh, my university at the University of Sheffield in the UK. There was a very interesting study by uh, a researcher, Dube, uh, on the design and implementation of presumptive taxes. These were taxes focusing only on minibus tax operators. Dubé studies presumptive taxes in Zimbabwe and shows they can be damaging. What are presumptive taxes? They are simplified regimes that are levied on the presumed rather than actual income of formal or informal enterprises. The very fact that they are presumed makes it uh, vulnerable to abuse uh, because someone might just impose a very unreasonable uh, high level of taxation on the mini tax uh, operators. So in terms of this uh, or in their design, these taxes can be based on turnover, uh, which is fair if it is really capturing a, a very good estimate of the turnover when the taxi owners are expected to keep basic records of sales to really get uh, some handle on this turnover. And it will be good if the indicators of uh, income capacity are also well known, for instance, uh, where the tax amount is based on the number of seats in the taxi. But you cannot assume that all those seats will be occupied at each and every single hour of the day. Therefore, there should be some reasonable assumption of potential income capacity and also actual turnover that uh, the taxi owners uh, manage to, to, to achieve. But this only uh, will be the case if there are uh, some records. So these presumptive taxes can be standard lump sum assessments paid by all minibus operators and a combination of these matters. And at the same time, they should also be provided uh, services. Uh, always I want to emphasize uh, the two side nature of tax payment and also receipt of services by taxpayers. Uh, you will not really be compliant if you feel that your money is going to be wasted by public authorities and they always milk you, but they don't give you any, any of the service that you demand. So some presumptive tax designs have been implemented in the informal sector, some of which may be appropriate in taxing transport operators, for instance, in this case, uh, with a case of minibus tax operators. I will introduce one important concept here, uh, the tax gap and I will discuss what it contains. Tax gap is the difference between the amount that the tax imposed by the tax regulation document or code and the amount that is reported as paid. Therefore, when you have collection inefficiency, the gap will be wider. Therefore, you impose a tax, and if you are aiming to collect 2 billion US dollars this year, and if you collect 2 billion, that is fine. But if you aim for 2 billion and you collect only half a million, there is a huge gap. Uh, therefore, when there is inefficiency, this tax gap is usually wide. And Africa's tax gap uh, sometimes is huge. The gap can be calculated for each of the direct and income taxes we mentioned earlier. Yeah, because sometimes uh, inefficiency might be severe in one tax type or in one tax structure as opposed to another one. In countries where income 
or economic agents rarely report tax returns. Data on tax gap is unreliable. And, and this is uh, characterizing or uh, Africa's public agents or public finance agents uh, have these characteristics because generally we rarely depend on uh, reported uh, tax returns when it comes to computing the amount imposed and the amount uh, collected. One example of the challenges surrounding uh, the value added tax. The gap is created for a variety of reasons. For instance, some people might just refuse to pay. Uh, poor collection efficiency and also the records might be tampered with and lack of careful administration uh, embedding the exemption for the poor and those who need to pay a lower rate. Even if that by design is a flat rate imposed on anybody, regardless of their income position, it can also be uh, administered fairly because you can exempt particularly goods that are consumed by the lower end of the population in the form of income distribution uh, so that fairness is built into this flat tax rate. Economic report on Africa of 2019 indicate the power of VAT to raise revenue in Africa, given the big tax gap of 50% for 2018, for instance. This is huge, meaning you just simply collect half of what you uh, imposed or designed. However, the equity element of the tax and its administration should be given sufficient attention. I think in, as it, we were emphasizing on many of the taxes, I think this should be also the case for VAT. Uh, one very practical step taken by some countries include, for instance, exempting fuel and food and oil, uh, cooking oil uh, from uh, the, the VAT payment, which is really good for uh, social security reasons. So what are the outstanding problems, issues that should be tackled uh, as we go forward. Uh, one is large informal sector. This is very structural and there is no easy answer to that, but we try to mention some issues that can help us to think really further and deeper into uh, how we can really bring the informal sector into uh, the tax net. It's not necessarily bringing the, the sector into the tax net, but necessarily, uh, sufficiently and essentially how we can really reduce the incidence of uh, informal economic activity and uh, provide better uh, employment uh, in general uh, for our population because that sector is absorbing a lot of smart aspiring individuals who couldn't really get uh, formal employment after graduation. And this is a huge problem for, for Africa. So it is high time that we give a lot of attention to the sector. So it relates to also the public finance aspect that we are studying here. So second challenge, the agricultural sector has the potential, but tax collection is difficult because of large number of unregistered, widely dispersed small scale farmers, it makes it difficult for revenue authorities to verify incomes and tax liability. Third, land taxes pose collection difficulties despite a simple structure. Here we may refer to the property tax situation that we were discussing earlier. Usually valuation is on the technical level, the biggest problem here. This is because inadequate data and valuation practices, incomplete property coverage and high level of political uh, interference. And at the same time, dynamics is also important. What do I mean by dynamics? Because the land value today is very different from the land value tomorrow. Therefore, dynamics should be built. There should be a regular revision of uh, the taxes that should be imposed on properties. So as the valuation changes, the tax also changes. So there should be a system which is in inbuilt in the way we design tax policy, particularly for some sensitive and very important taxes such as land taxes and property tax. The fourth challenge, low level of tax compliance via tax evasion and capital flight from the continent 
uh, which we are well aware of because capital flight, one area of evading tax is just uh, distort the way capital is registered, the way profits are registered by uh, multinational companies. So through capital flight, even by public authorities, uh, public officials or corrupt elite uh, can be used to evade taxes that should have been paid to uh, public authorities. Uh, I have done some work on this area uh, and it went into as a book chapter to a capital flight, its causes and consequences uh, uh, project in the work that we did with the African Economic Research Consortium. So taxation and capital flight have a very, very strong correlation there. And I have done some work on also on Afrobarometer survey on the tax compliance aspect, which I will discuss uh, at some point uh, today. The fifth challenge is a digital economy it helps business to avoid taxes, especially cross border uh, operations. And uh, box 3.6 of ERA will help you to understand that. And finally, to corruption of tax officials. Uh, especially at the collection stage, uh, in addition to the corruption of any government official who takes part through capital flight. And the last uh, challenge we summarize here is the rest to the bottom, which is leading countries to reduce taxes for foreign companies, for instance, reduce uh, capital gain tax. Uh, but we should be very careful. I'll quickly summarize this uh, technical study that I did uh, on the basis of the Afrobarometer uh, survey, uh, which I would like to uh, revise uh, in the current round of uh, my research because there are additional new data sets that have come from Afrobarometer survey as many more countries are included in recent uh, surveys. In this paper, what I studied was uh, what really drives tax compliance. Uh, therefore, uh, I, I want to understand the drivers of tax compliance, or if you like, the drivers of tax evasion. Uh, if you don't comply, that means you, you are evading. The other interesting reading you might uh, like to have a look at is a chapter 12 of the book that I mentioned to you, uh, which is uh, done through a project for African Economic Research Consortium and published in a book edited by uh, Leons de Comana and uh, uh, Ibi Ajay, uh, which came out uh, as a Oxford University Press book with an edited contribution from many, many individuals. When I go back to this tax compliance study using the Afrobarometer survey, which you can really access because it's easily publicly available once you declare the, your research interest. It is an opinion survey. And the opinion is, should we pay tax? And people have different answers. And based on that answer, I did some uh, modeling. But let me motivate it quickly. The research-wise, the motivation is that I want to extend the existing tax evasion work on Africa in the context of social contract or public good provision. What do I mean by that? Uh, here, I wanted to see whether individuals living in a country where governments provide services are more compliant than individuals who are living in countries where the government doesn't provide services, various services, which I will uh, come into. Therefore, if there is a strong negative correlation between uh, tax evasion and also service provision, there is a direct policy implication to uh, governments, which is a no brainer. Therefore, I, I wanted to provide some empirical evidence on the relationship between the probability of compl be complying to tax demands uh, in circumstances where service provision is heterogeneous or different. So this is falling into the tax moral or the tax compliance literature. 
and uh, we are using different rounds of the Afrobarometer survey data. Compliance propensity or studying compliance propensity is very useful for better understanding of evasion behavior. And uh, little is known in this area in Africa, especially using uh, recent uh, data sets or large data sets on opinions of individuals. Tax evasion is a developmental problem uh, and it is gaining momentum because now we are pushing towards DRM, domestic resource mobilization, tax reform, tax administration, tax efficiency, and also having a handle on the informal sector. And overseas development assistance, foreign aid is declining. FDI is also declining. This was happening even before COVID, but now it has been dramatic and the rich countries themselves are uh, struggling through excessive borrowing. Therefore, because of that, we have to raise our own funds. If we have to raise our own funds, uh, how the degree of compliance in society should be studied and what really drives that degree of compliance. It is not only the service provision idea that I'm uh, trying to get at here, which is at the center of the relationship between tax compliance uh, and uh, public finance or fiscal space, but there are other factors that we will control for in the modeling. Taxable potential and tax administrative inefficiency is very, very uh, evident in Africa. Therefore, we have uh, a scope to mobilize more resources uh, so we can collect more. Resources for social protection, resources for infrastructure, resources for social uh, sectors like education and health, and also poverty reduction. So the tax revenue as a proportion of GDP is a function of income uh, for sure. I will jump the details of uh, the theoretical foundation of studying the economics of crime, the, the economics of tax evasion, the economics of tax compliance. Rather, I will just focus on some of the key variables that really drive the amount of money that you declare, meaning the amount of income that you are happy to be taxed on. Usually, the comparative statics, which is summarized towards the end of the page it highlights the following. For instance, the amount of income that you declare increases if you feel that you are going to be caught or sent to jail. And there is also an increasing uh, experimental evidence coming and supporting this evidence or this comparative static result. And the declared income is also a function of, or a positive function of fines or penal penalties. It is also an increasing function of your wealth uh, and tax rate. It is very, very difficult. It's ambiguous. Therefore, uh, in circumstances where you have a higher tax rate, there is high payment. And there is also, there is a high payment or a high declaration, a high level of income declaration in circumstances where you have lower uh, taxes. So the empirical evidence is very, very, uh, ambiguous there, therefore we just sign it in uh, both inequalities. Okay, I think I'll pass this. Uh, there are experimental evidence and I'll just summarize uh, some of the results. But just before I summarize, I will highlight uh, one additional comparative statics. There is this literature which is focusing on the a rewarding component of paying. For instance, if you declare your income, you know that you are paying taxes or your tax obligations will come to your uh, doorsteps. But at the same time, you know what, where your money is going. And if you feel that what you are doing is a social contribution or a contribution to society uh, by enabling public authorities to provide services for societal members who are less fortunate than you are, uh, you have this glow effect or the, they call it the warm glow effect of paying taxes or golden glow. So you, you feel very good about yourself. Therefore, th that really uh, increases your uh, compliance. If it increases your compliance, 
uh, there is a higher level of uh, declared income uh, or a higher level of X. But at the same time, if you feel that uh, maybe you don't have to make a contribution and you feel that somewhere down the line, your contribution in the form of tax may not be confer converted to societal benefits, uh, you, you may be reluctant. Therefore, your warm glow effect, if it is not too strong, if it is very lukewarm or uh, very cold, uh, you may not declare your income because you may say, no, well, why should I pay? Because I don't feel that I'm uh, contributing to society and I don't think that will really go to less fortunate individuals in my uh, community or in my uh, country. So in this case, this comparative statics uh, can either be uh, positive or negative, depending on the strengths of your feeling or the warm glow effect. So there are some uh, tensions there. The data that we have used is the data for three webs, 2004, 2005, and 2008, but there are many, many uh, excessive, no, su successive data sets in recent years. So we, we, we could uh, build the case for many, many individuals. But the study that I did uh, was based on 69,000 uh, individuals. And this is a repeated cross-section. So it's a pooled data set that I have used. And I provided more uh, details on the uh, slides that are uh, uploaded. And you can also really investigate further what you can get from uh, this data. And I think the observation is that most of the Southern African countries are well represented in this data set. Okay, what are the key outcome variables that we are interested in? I think the first important variable is the answer given to the question or the opinion of individuals uh, with regards to the statements that you see uh, on the first line of this slide. Tax should be paid. Do you agree or not? S some people say strongly agree and others say strongly disagree and uh, in between. So that is a dependent variable. And the nature of the dependent variable is just ordinary. You can order it. So if it is ordinal, it is ordered. And such ordered outcomes can be modeled with what we call ordered probit or logit models, because these are uh, discrete choice, uh, binary, as well as uh, discrete uh, outcomes. Uh, in this case, our discrete outcomes, five of them can be collapsed into three because strongly agree and agree can be just simply say agree and disagree and strongly disagree can be classified as disagree. Therefore, the five options or responses can be collapsed into three. Because we have three outcomes, they cannot be binary discrete outcomes, rather three multiple outcomes. And because of the ordered nature of the dependent variable, we can either use a ordered probit or, or ordered logit. The only difference between probit and logit is that uh, they are different in their uh, assumptions or distributional assumptions of the error term. Under the probit model, the error term is normally distributed with constant variance and uh, zero mean. And under logit uh, assumptions uh, in terms of the error term, it will follow a logistic distribution. So the only change between the two or difference between the two is that one is uh, one of the distributional assumptions. Therefore, the distributional assumptions about the error term is uh, different. So it doesn't really matter whether you have used ordered logit or ordered uh, probit. And that depends on your uh, belief of the nature of the distribution of your uh, Error. Okay, in terms of results, the data shows over the four years that I have uh, seen over the four year window, there is little change over the over time on tax moral, meaning tax compliance didn't change in any direction in any meaningful way. 
But if you trust your government, tax compliance has uh, a positive tendency or there is a positive correlation between tax compliance uh, and trust in government. The percentage of those who believe their government is corrupt declined uh, on the data. Old individuals are more likely to be tax compliant, and this is consistent with international evidence. Males are more compliant, but only for the 2000 wave. But in the other two waves, uh, they are not compliant. And I think they are less likely to be compliant uh, when we compare it with uh, international evidence. For instance, our study, which was published in the European Journal of Industrial Relations, indicates that uh, males are usually the offenders. Uh, more educated, more compliant, that is uh, consistent and as we expect. And professionals are not necessarily compliant, but they were only compliant in 2005 uh, sample. Uh, that's a surprising result, uh, but that is uh, what we have found. Provision of public goods and services, as I highlighted or uh, underscored at the beginning, is very, very important. Therefore, if you provide railway services, postal services, police, water, electricity, garbage collection, and sewage services in the level that require, is required or acceptable, uh, even if it is not top quality public uh, service, uh, individuals are more compliant. And it really confirms what we were trying to uh, conjecture. Respect for property rights, less corruption and fair treatment lead to better compliance. Evidence on actual tax paid uh, is also uh, estimated using other models. So what are the policy takeaway messages? Provide public goods. Uh, that is the direct implication from this analysis. We are not saying this because just, it just makes common sense. It is because the evidence suggests it. And the survey of our citizens indicates that. But no strong enforcement of public policy in Africa uh, is uh, order of the day. So that, that should really uh, change. And uh, I will say something about enforcement when we discuss uh, this week about uh, in the webinar, uh, particularly uh, when we discuss about uh, module two contents. Hence governments should address the joint problem of public good provision as well as weak public policy enforcement, because sometimes tax are not collected because of lack of enforcement too. And the second key message is provide uh, goods, but the provision of public goods should be equitable. Uh, and we can also use some instruments under our armor uh, to encourage tax compliance uh, because we can provide public services, but at the same time, after we have done so, if there are offenders who are evading taxes, we should penalize them. Uh, therefore, there is a combination of carrot and the stick here. The provision of public goods is a carrot, and the stick is the fines and the, and the penalties. One thing that I would advise everyone, uh, and also my PhD students, my colleagues, uh, always even myself, I, I learned a lot uh, through uh, reading as well as research, uh, not to make policy statements without analysis. Therefore, everything that you say about policy recommendation should come from analysis. So this uh, small piece of research that I've done uh, on the Afrobarometer survey is uh, one piece of research one piece of analysis, which has a very clear policy recommendation. Therefore, what I suggested is based on the analysis, not just because it makes sense. Okay, uh, that concludes uh, the first part of module two and a very interesting uh, topic, but very, very uh, detailed too. Uh, I hope uh, it uh, helps you to understand the module much better than the uh, PowerPoints that you are reading from the forum. Okay, thank you very much for listening and uh, I will see you and also talk to you as I record others.